Well, thank you, Sarah. Perfect timing. That I, you finished as I was coming in, and good evening, everyone. It's uh, good for us to gather again in God's house to finish our day of rest. We're called to worship this evening from Psalm 72. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. Lord, our God and Heavenly Father, what a, a joy and a privilege it is for us to gather here in this time and place to bring you our praise and worship. We thank you for this good day you have blessed us with. We thank you that uh, we can be here together to hear your word read and proclaimed. And so we ask that you will bless us with your presence uh, and open our hearts uh, to, see, to receive your word and your message for us in this day. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing, uh, I love you, Lord.
let's join together in professing our faith, saying in unison, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Opportunity to uh, go before God in a time of prayer. One one thing we forgot to pray for this morning, out of sight, out of mind, sometimes is is uh, Les Lynam. I'm grateful that he's returned home from the hospital, and uh, we need to continue to pray for him. Is there anything else that we can pray for this evening? Yes, Bruce. What's her name? Rosine. Rosine. Okay, we want to pray for uh, Rosine, friends in New Jersey, uh, who's starting chemo tomorrow. Yeah, so we will pray for her. Anyone else? Yes, Bruce. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I intend to pray for those on our sheet, and Bob is one of those, and uh, still having a tough go with his uh, dialysis, so we want to con continue to pray for Bob. Anyone else? Oh, Bruce. Yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, Bruce is reminding us about Doug DeHaan. Good news that he's off dialysis. His kidney is working again, and uh, we can give thanks to God for, for that, that answer to prayer. Yes, indeed. Anyone else? Well, let's go before God then in this time of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, we give you thanks again for this beautiful, wonderful day, for this season of the year where we're able to be outside and uh, enjoy uh, the outdoors. We're thankful for this time of year where um, many are able to travel and enjoy, enjoy time off, vacations, and, and uh, seeing family and friends. And that is a, a wonderful gift from you, and we give you thanks for that. We're, we pray for all those who will be on the road today and tomorrow returning from a long holiday weekend. We ask, Father, that uh, you uh, keep them safe as they travel. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, uh, a prayer of thanksgiving again for um, uh, this week where we celebrated our, our nation's birthday and we're grateful for all that we have and enjoy in this great land, and uh, we are always mindful that this is, is a good gift from you. We thank you for your 
daily care and provision for us. You provide for us uh, in and through the work you have given us to do. That too is a, another gift from you that allows us to worship you every single day in and through the work that you have given us to do. We thank you for talent and abilities to, to do many things and uh, we're thankful for that you have created each one of us so uniquely gifted and, and uh, that we are able uh, together to um, bless the church and to serve her in all of the various ways uh, because of the giftedness of everyone here in this congregation and we thank you for that. We thank you for your son Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sin that we have through his one and only death on the cross for the hope and assurance of everlasting life because of his resurrection from the grave and how he now sits at your right hand uh, uh, enthroned in heaven following his ascension and we're thankful father that you bless us with his presence through the power of your holy spirit and this too is a, a wonderful good gift and we're thankful for this avenue of prayer, that we can uh, uh, be with you and, and talk to you and listen to you. And uh, we're thankful, Father, that you hear our prayers and respond. We give thanks that, uh, that Doug DeHaan is doing so much better, that he is off uh, from the dialysis machine, his kidney is functioning uh, again, and what a wonderful answer to prayer that is. And, we give you thanks uh, for how you have watched out over Doug and cared for him and walked with him in this difficult journey. We pray also for Bob Haveman in this time as he continues on with the dialysis uh, um, uh, several days a week for many hours at a time. We pray uh, for his healing. We pray that you'll be with him as he endures these treatments and we ask Father that that you give him uh, the strength uh, needed to undergo these treatments. We pray that you will um, grant him uh, patience in the process of healing. And we most of all pray that he will uh, feel your presence and be assured and, and that he will experience uh, your wonderful, marvelous peace. Father, we also uh, pray for Les Linema, and we're grateful that after another long stay in the hospital, he was able to return home this week. We pray that uh, you will give him uh, continued strength and healing each day as, uh, as he carries on. We pray, Father, that here too, that um, he, will not, he and Rena will not lose hope, but rather will be encouraged day by day and that uh, they will um, uh, be able to get back on uh, on track with a, a treatment schedule that his platelet numbers will uh, be fitting for each of these treatments so that they will not be delayed. And again, Father, we pray for a, a wonderful, marvelous healing and for less. We pray that you will also be with him day by day as he continues along this journey and may he too experience your comfort and your peace your peace that surpasses all understanding. And Father, we also pray for, uh, for Rosine in New Jersey as uh, she is undergoing treatment for brain cancer. We pray that you will be with her tomorrow as uh, uh, she uh, begins chemotherapy treatment. We ask, Father, that you too bless her as well with uh, comfort and peace. We pray that you'll give her the strength and the stamina she needs to endure these treatments. And, and most of all, Father, we ask that you bring about a, a wonderful and marvelous healing for her. We ask that you be with her family as well. And may they too know the peace and comfort, uh, knowing that she is being held uh, securely in the, the very hollow of your hand. And Father, uh, we thank you for this congregation. We thank you for how you have provided for her uh, generation after generation in her long history. We are thankful, Father, for 
the members of this church and how you have blessed us in so many ways and that you have blessed uh, this church uh, over the years with faithful leadership. And, and as we soon welcome uh, Joel Trinidad uh, into our midst in September, we pray that you'll be with him in the coming year as he um, continues to find his bearings in ministry as he works with us and, and goes about his pastoral work and his uh, preaching each week, we ask that you give him um, that you give him the strength and the wisdom that he needs uh, to, uh, to carry out uh, his his calling from you. We pray that uh, uh, we as a congregation will receive his ministry well and that uh, this will be a wonderful year of mutual growth. And uh, we're thankful, Father, that uh, you have um, seen fit to send Joel to us at this time. And Father, uh, we also pray for our missionaries that we support in this congregation. We pray for the Shardas, uh, the Smiths, the, the Walkers and the Teamires and the various mission fields that you have called them to. We ask that you bless them with health and strength. We ask that you bless them with uh, safety and security as well as, as in some of the places they serve are, are uh, sometimes very hostile to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And we pray that even in the midst of this, uh, that their work will, be, will bear much fruit for the sake of your church and your kingdom. And so please, Lord, keep them in your loving care. And Father, as we now worship you with our gifts and uh, our offerings, we're grateful that we can support the, the Martin Resource Center. We're thankful for the good work uh, this ministry does in, in providing for uh, the material and nutritional needs of, uh, of those in this community. We're, we're thankful that uh, we as a community can come together through this ministry uh, to serve you by uh, serving the poor and the needy. Please bless the gifts that we give. We pray that uh, uh, this ministry will continue to do its good work and that it will flourish. We pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, I invite the deacons to come forward. We'll receive your gifts for uh, the Martin Resource Center. I invite you to open your Bibles to uh, James, uh, the New Testament book of James, chapter 5. 
We'll be looking at uh, verses 1 through 6 today. A warning to the rich. And before we read God's word, let's bow for a moment in prayer. Gracious Savior Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. As this scripture is read and preached in this hour, empower us to hear it with humility and openness so that in hearing it, we may respond with courage and conviction. Amen. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. This is the word of our Lord. Well, my dear friends, uh, we've been looking, uh, we've spent a lot of time looking at this letter from James over the last uh, couple of months, and and I wonder if you have noticed what I have noticed about this letter, and it's the fact that James always seems to return to the same themes over and over again. And one of the themes he comes back to this evening is that of wealth or earthly riches. James addressed wealth back in chapter 2 when he wrote uh, about not showing favoritism to the wealthy. And tonight, he once again gets right to the heart of the matter right away in verse 1. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Now when we read that, we have to remember to whom he is writing, the servants of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. These brothers and sisters were persecuted for their faith. And in the face of these great trials, it seems that many of these believers were tempted to place their hope in wealth or they were simply enamored by their wealth. And so James is here offering one more warning about living for wealth or placing your hope and confidence in wealth. Now, before we look at the passage in front of us, we we have to make a few observations. We have to have uh, a a few ground rules in place, so to speak, so as to make sure we know to whom this passage is addressed. First of all, not every wealthy person lives for wealth, nor does every wealthy person expect favoritism. And that's encouraging. And, And I'm grateful that over the years, Uh, that I have known many uh, wealthy people who uh, are exactly that way. They're humble. uh, They don't expect to be the first one in line. They they don't expect people to um, uh, fawn all over them. And then second, uh, many poor or middle class people pursue wealth as avidly as some of the rich. Uh, Someone once said that the the poor man can hoard his crusts just as much as the rich man hoards his gold. It's a pretty profound statement, and and I I think uh, we can accept that as as very true. And so, in verse 1, James directs his words to those who have gained their wealth by exploitation, by taking advantage of others. He writes... Now listen, you rich people. Uh, You rich people weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Interesting phrase there. Now listen. That phrase is an attention grabber because what follows is so very important and James addresses his readers with his usual directness. 
And again, James is here referring to wealthy landowners. These would be the ones who uh, are most likely to be selfish and unfeeling toward the working class poor or, in James's day, the, the slaves that they employed to work their land. And so James confronts these wealthy people with their pending doom. He says they're going to weep and wail, which is, uh, which is a stronger kind of statement than saying, oh, you're going to have a little boo-hooing. This phrase means that their weeping and wailing will come with loud shrieking, with great lament. And why should the rich, who have unlimited power and comfort at their fingertips, who have servants at their beck and call, be in such misery? James elaborates on his reasons in the next few verses. So first, the wealthy were guilty of hoarding their wealth. In verses 2 and 3, he announces a word of judgment about, about to come on them. Your wealth has rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Ouch, All right? If, if you were a wealthy person in James's day, this is a horrible judgment. And, and notice, too, we, we have to see how James puts this phrase in the past tense. It, it is already upon those who have gained their wealth through exploiting the poor. And notice also that the way, the way wealth is defined or identified. The symbols of wealth can be seen in silver and gold, and in expensive clothing. In simple terms then, James' word is this. Those who seek their fulfillment in the here and now through the things of this world, stolen from those who have even less of this world's things, will lose everything they have in the coming day of judgment. In fact, what else we could say is that this is a terrible way to live. And so, just as riches spoil, so does the spirit of those who hoard their wealth. Why hold on to your wealth for the last day so that someone else can come and take it from you? The second reason the wealthy faced doom and judgment was because of the fact that they cheated others, because they took advantage of the poor. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Now, we have to remember that in that time and place, there were no long-term labor contracts for the common laborers. It, it wasn't as if you could show up at the lo local auto factory when you were 18 years old uh, and get a lifetime job working next to your father and perhaps your brothers with, with good pay, a, a pension, health insurance, and paid vacations. In those days, the poor were day laborers who did not know from day to day if there would be work for them. They always seemed to, they always lived on the verge of starvation. And so yes, James is leveling some serious charges against the, the wealthy. First, they have not only failed to show compassion to the poor, they have, they have exploited them. And the evil rich have used the effort of the poor to gain wealth for themselves. They have not paid fair wages. And after all, the law of God demands a just and fair compensation for a person's work. To do otherwise is to cause a hurt, which in the end reaches the ear of God. And we can say that because the Bible is very clear on this issue, and thus the wealthy have no excuse. He murders his neighbor who deprives him of his living, and he who defrauds a hireling of his wages is a shedder of blood. That comes right out of the Old Testament in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and Malachi. 
And then next, in verse 5, we read, You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. In other words, the rich have set themselves up in, ex in extravagant luxury while others around them have nothing. And worse still is a luxury gained by exploiting the most vulnerable in society, the day laborer. And so James is here. He's condemning them for being selfish. He is condemning them for living a life of unrestrained self-gratification. It's the old eat, drink, and be merry, and while you're at it, becomes fat. Become fat, says James, who goes on to add that you are going to get slaughtered. And so as they eat and drink, they're ignoring the judgment that is about to come upon them. And then the last reason for James' stinging rebuke of the rich is that they have taken advantage of the righteous. Verse 6 tells us, You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. James is charging the rich with murder. And let's admit it, this is a, a very serious accusation that James is leveling here. It, it suggests that these deaths are on their hands through starving them by withholding just wages. And, and even worse, their victims could not oppose them. And when they suffered and died, the wealthy class were unaware and unaffected. And so James is warning the wealthy that God takes it very personally when the poor are mistreated and abused. James, after all, re, um, re, or Jesus reminds us in Matthew's Gospel in the Sermon on the Mount that he considers the mistreatment of the poor to be our treatment of him. So this is indeed a very serious warning. And we have to admit, it's not easy in a complex society like ours to draw the, the line between uh, enjoying a fair share of the bounty of God's creation versus overindulging, overindulging in wealth. And isn't it interesting, if we, if we were to really examine ourselves and in the ways that we use and manage uh, what has been given to us, usually we consider the class just above us as the indulgers or the overindulgers, but rarely ourselves. Uh, through working hard and being diligent and thrifty, we should be able to accumulate enough of this world's wealth to satisfy all of our desires and then some. And then nothing more is asked of us other than not exploiting others in the process and being willing then to share something out of our abundance with those who are less fortunate. I, I think I said something about this several months ago, right before Thanksgiving, that one of the, one of the benefits or one of the things that we are able to do when we have been abundantly supplied is that we have the opportunity to share with others who are in need. But as we go on thinking about this passage, there are some other warnings for us that we should take to heart, not just in uncertain economic times as, as we sometimes go through in this nation, um, but money and wealth do pose a grave danger to us as Christians, and as we know, it is the love of money that will place us under God's judgment because it is the love of money that leads uh, to, to down the path of destruction. So, let's think of three things then that, re, that this passage reminds us of. And first is the futility of hoarding. As James reminds us, the things of this world are subject to, de to decay, so it is best to use what we have before we have little left to use. Jesus illustrated this so well in the parable of the talents found in Matthew and Luke's Gospels. The servant who hid his talent uh, rather than putting it, in, uh, putting it into use, he was condemned for his lack of action. And yes, we must prudently use the wealth God has entrusted to us, but it is, it is entrusted to us 
to be used. So, if this passage serves up any kind of warning, it is in how we support the poor. When we hoard and do not share, we are denying God's ongoing provision in our lives. And then second, God is not condemning people who are wealthy, but he is condemning the wrong priorities of the wealthy. And that's a a very important distinction. Being wealthy does come with some special risks and some particular pressures which can then twist priorities. And one of the risks is coming to, to, is, is when you come to a place where you Uh, put so much trust in your wealth that you may be prone to thinking that you have no need of God or of any of his provision in your life. And yet we, we all know how easily unexpected events can overtake us. Those That's a kind of a standard, right? In this life there are going to be unexpected events that happen. And uh, it's a powerful reminder for us here that no amount of wealth can insulate us from all of the sufferings in this life. In fact, money can blind us to the realities of this life and of what God expects from us. And then third, we must be aware of the trap of pleasure. Uh, As one author put it, the pursuit of pleasure for its own sake is always ultimately unsatisfying, and it becomes addictive. And the reason for this is that if we uh, pursue pleasure, we fail to get it. And this is because you cannot separate pleasure from the act that gives it. The person who exploits does so for self-pleasing, such is selfish greed, and in the end, it is not satisfying. So it's not easy for a believer to function untainted by the materialism of this world. Let's face it, we are faced with constant messages to to spend and to acquire and to experience all that uh, this world has to offer us. So if we do find ourselves then in the pleasure trap, willing to exploit for self-pleasing, then we need, truly, to humble ourselves before the Lord. Come near to God, and he will come near to you, and he will lift you up. Those are some good biblical warnings for us. And so it's no wonder James tells the worldly rich to weep and wail. Money is a good servant. Money is a good servant but it is a poor master. The lure for gold and wealth can sometimes be much stronger than the human will. And with, uh, with many people, it stands between their soul and, his, and their God. And someday it'll be discovered that the bars that shut many out of the kingdom of, of heaven are bars that are forged from gold and silver. As Proverbs tells us in chapter 30, many wealthy people don't think they need God. But wealth in no way lessens our need to rely on God. If anything, it increases it. We are in greater spiritual danger when we have plenty than when we have nothing. Now, we have to remember here that James wants us to make sure that we are not like the worldly wealthy. He wants us to cry out to God for the grace to never, ever stop trusting in him. He wants us to cry out to God that our wealth comes only by the godliest of ways. He wants us to cry out to God that wealth never comes at the expense of our soul. And so as a concluding thought, I I want you to wonder with me and and perhaps uh, into this coming week, uh, wonder uh, about how you think uh, about wealth. Here's the thought I want to leave with you. Has there ever been a time 
in your life when you became rich within. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 tells us, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So for just a moment, forget about your bank account and then consider your soul account. Do you possess, do you possess the riches of his grace through faith? in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord our God and Heavenly Father, um, we give you thanks for the wonderful ways that you have provided for us, for the ways that you have allowed uh, many of us to prosper, uh, sometimes beyond our, our wildest imaginations. But let us never forget Heavenly Father, that you are the source of all that we have. Help us to use that which you have given us, whether it is a lot or a little, to use it wisely, use it for the sake of others and for uh, the sake of your church and the spreading of your gospel good news. Help us, Lord God, in these days ahead to consider uh, our attitudes about wealth. Help us, Lord, to use it to your honor and to your glory. We ask and pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let's stand together. Uh, let's sing, uh, I'd rather have Jesus. receive God's parting blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the peace and the presence of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you always. 
Amen.